Okay, so if you got my email yesterday, you know that we're going to have a review today. Did you get that email? And then you also know that uh, this will be our last meeting here. And uh, I know you're going to miss it. <laughs> You'll see me in the fall. So, um, so then the lecture time on Thursday, I'll just have office hours. So people with questions and problems and things like that can stop by on Thursday. Um, I will send you some information about uh, the final exam, maybe by tomorrow, so you know how to prepare for it. And then today I'll just run a review. We'll go over some problems from past final exams that will serve as a guide. Let's see, does anybody have any questions before I start? No questions? Okay, so um, essentially you should prepare uh, the material after the midterm. So I believe that's chapter four. So four, five, six, and seven is what you need to focus on. All right. I won't ask you any specific questions about the first three chapters. But obviously, you, by this, at this point, you should be very um, used to looking things up in tables, uh, uh, property data in tables, uh, drawing diagrams, many of the things that we learned um, in the first three chapters. And of course, the first law of thermodynamics, we're still using it. In fact, chapter four, um, this still deals with the first law of thermodynamics, but applied to control volume. It's the first time that we use it for an open system. So if you want to break this down, then chapter four is uh, first law for control volumes. And so that's uh, when we were looking essentially at two types of problems involving control volumes. So uh, a cartoon would be this type of a problem, a flow through a device uh, in steady state. Uh, and also problems, um, <clears throat> unsteady problems, uh, a good cartoon for that would be perhaps something like this, where you only have, say, flow going in, nothing going out. So you're filling up a tank, you're filling up a canister, and this would be transient problems. So that's essentially what's in chapter four. Then uh, <clears throat> the next three chapters, five, six, and seven, deal with the second law of thermodynamics. So, but then we can break them down. Chapter five, is the one where the second law is introduced. And, but that's the chapter where the concepts of ideal cycles, uh, thermodynamic efficiency of cycles, and the statements of the, uh, of the second law, the Kelvin-Planck statement and the uh, Clausius statement are introduced. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm just, I'll, I'll just put some of those things here, but this is not, of course, are comprehensive, so cycles, um, efficiency, I'll just write eta, efficiency of a cycle, thermodynamic efficiency, the Carnot, the Carnot cycles, as ideal cycles. And uh, maybe a few other miscellaneous things, all the concepts of our thermal reservoirs, are in there. So it's a very conceptual chapter, as you recall. Uh, and then um, the next chapter then defines entropy. So chapter six is where entropy is defined. And then we can actually write an equation that we can use in problems uh, for the second law. So entropy and the second law. Uh, 
Uh, the new concepts that appear here are, for example, uh, entropy generation, And then this is also the chapter where the isentropic process is defined, which is very important for us. Right, a process uh, which is isentropic, which by this point we know that it has to be adiabatic and reversible. And then, and then we develop a number of relationships for isentropic processes, all the isentropic process relationships, uh, particularly for ideal gases. So the same thing. For ideal gas, all the isentropic uh, relations. And then, um, finally, chapter seven, which is the one we covered mostly last week, deals, is essentially the equivalent of chap what chapter one did for the first law. So this is now second law for control volumes. <clears throat> so that's sort of the chapter that has everything that we have seen. Uh, because obviously, most of the problems where you have to apply the second law to get something, to get some solution to the problem, are problems where you also have to apply the first law. And because it's control volumes, these are open systems, so there is flow coming in, flow coming out. Uh, so, so chapter seven really is the, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the chapter that has everything in it. Uh, so if you should practice uh, for the exam by solving problems from every chapter, uh, looking at example problems that we have solved here and some that are in the text from every chapter, but if you want to try then some, if you still have time to do some additional problems, then chapter seven um, <clears throat> will do that for you. And it also has, at the very end, the last thing we did is the concept of the uh, isentropic efficiencies. So, isentropic efficiency of devices. Right. So that's a, sort of a skeleton of the material that we have seen, we have seen since, the, um, since a little bit before the midterm and the material that will go into the final exam. So like I said, I have a number of problems. I just took a few, a uh, couple of all exams. And um, I'll go over those. You'll see problems, uh, example problems from the different sections. Yes? Are we allowed equation sheets for the final? Are you allowed what? Equation sheets? Yes, and I will, I will give you the instructions uh, by email. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the midterm I don't allow because it's really uh, not a lot of equations, and it's good for you to uh, remember some of those because there are very few. But as you can see, in these four chapters, there are lots of equations. So I don't want to impose the burden of additional memorization. So you'll have some instructions. Make sure when, you, when I send you the email that this, um, the subject will be instructions for the final exam. You prepare that uh, equation sheet uh, following those instructions. I actually will give you a point. Uh, if, you're, if your uh, equations are prepared the way I want you to prepare them, so you will get those. Any other questions? Okay, so let's look at some um, of these examples. <clears throat> the format will be similar, so there will be a few problems that are multiple choice questions, like the ones you have seen, so review those that we have gone through and think about some others. Uh, multiple choice type of questions, and then problems. You had only two problems for the midterm, you probably have more, uh, at least three uh, on the final exam. So, Okay, so let's look at these problems. Here's one. So this problem says, <clears throat> Maybe I'll 
flash this statement there. It'll be easier. Uh, let me just write it down. So it has to do with a heat pump. So the statement says that we have a heat pump right, that is used to heat a house in the winter. Okay, so all right, heat a house in the winter. And then in the summer time, the summer uh, time, we reverse the heat pump, run it as a refrigerator, to cool the house in the summer. So reversed in summer to cool the house. All right. Okay. So in the winter. The house uh, temperature, let's actually call it the house, we want it to be 20 Celsius. Right? And in the summer, the house is 25 Celsius. Right. And so what happens is that this house in the, um, here's my little house, okay, in the, um, in the winter it loses heat to the surroundings. And that rate is this Q dot is 0 0.5 kilowatts per degree um, of delta T. I'll tell you what that. It says uh, it loses 0 0.5 kilowatts per degree of temperature difference between the house and the surroundings. So, is 0.5 um, kilowatts per degree of the temperature difference between the house and the surroundings. And then in the summer is the opposite. So in the, in the summer, it gains the same. Okay? So 0.5 kilowatts per degree of temperature difference. So that's the statement of the problem. And then what you are to find is two things. First, in the winter, the outside temperature T outside is zero Celsius. What is the minimum power that I need to run that heat pump. Huh? Minimum power to run that heat pump. And then B, if I now run the device at twice the power, all right? so whatever power I find in part A, I run it twice, that power. And then if I run it at twice the power, what is the maximum outside temperature that the unit can um, work with in order to keep the house at the 25? So for twice the power, what is T out max? to keep the house at 25. So that's the problem, and those are the questions. So any questions? Anything not clear about the statement or what you're being asked? OK, uh, so if you were to say uh, to assign this problem to a chapter, which chapter is it? Uh, 
Nobody? Seven. No. Five. Five. Right? five. So, <clears throat> chapter five type of problem. Okay, so, so let's maybe draw a schematic of what's going on here. So let's do the two scenarios, first the winter and then the summer. So if we do a picture for the winter, all right, so let's say that this is the house, all right? And here is my heat pump. All right. The heat pump is obviously what I'm going to use in the winter to uh, put heat into the house. And uh, the house, I was told, loses uh, 0.5 kilowatts per degree of temperature difference to the surroundings. Right? So, so I should have the surroundings here. Let's say that this is the surroundings, right? And I was told that this house loses heat to the surroundings. Okay, so, and then the heat pump has to draw heat from somewhere. Where does it draw heat from? Also from the surroundings. So I have to have heat going into the heat pump like that, right? And what else do I need? I need to drive this heat pump, so this is precisely what I'm asked to find, right? Okay, so this is what I know. I know that this quantity right here is called this um, uh, Q loss is uh, 0 0.5 kilowatts per degree. Uh, so I would need to multiply this by a delta T Right, to get the, um, the right uh, power loss. And what is the delta T? Well, in the winter, the house, we were told, is at 20 Celsius. So this house is at 20 Celsius. And we're told that the surroundings in the winter are at 0 Celsius, so I can put that here. So now I know that my delta T is 20 degrees. So I put here 20, which is my delta T. So now I know that the loss is 10 kilowatts. That's the rate at which the house is losing heat, right? 10 kilowatts. So uh, for the heat pump, right, let's label these uh, Qs as we normally would. So I would say that this is the Q sub L right, for the heat pump, and this is the Q sub H. Right. Using conventional notation, just looking at the heat pump. What is the Q sub H? But do we know the amount of the Q sub H? That's crucial in this problem. If you don't see this, you have problems. Yes. Why? It has to be the same as Q loss. Why is that? Because otherwise the house was going to get hot if it's more. And if it's less, it's going to get cold. Right? So the house has to receive as much heat as it's losing right? by a simple energy balance. So that's important that we get that straight. So now we know the Q sub H, All right? And so uh, what else do we know? They ask for the minimum power. What does that mean? That's another key. How do I get the minimum power? Who said that? Raise your hand, I'm not going to shoot you. Who said that? <laughs> if it's ideal, that is correct. Right? So if it's ideal, right, the minimum uh, power requirement will imply 
that I deal with an ideal heat pump, a Carnot heat pump, for example. Okay, so if it is a Carnot heat pump, then that means that uh, Q dot L over Q dot H is equal to T L over T H, right? Because that's a relationship that holds for a for an ideal cycle. And the only thing I don't know here is Q dot L, so I can solve for Q dot L. It's going to be TL over TH times Q dot H. So what is uh, TL? So if I put zero Celsius there, I'm going to get zero Q sub L, so I better put it in Kelvin. That's another banana peel, right? So got to put it in Kelvin, to 273 over uh, the 293, right? Times 10 kilowatts. So if we do that, um, we get the Q. I don't have the actual number here. But we, so we get the Q sub L. And then, of course, what is W minimum? Oops, L. So the, once we get the Q sub L, we know that the power to drive the heat pump is Q sub H minus Q sub L. Yes? Do you need QL to solve this? Can't you use like efficiencies? Yeah, you could, you could write it. Well, not efficiency, but a coefficient of performance. But you end, you end up doing the same calculation. Um, <clears throat> I can write it in terms of a coefficient of performance, and then I would have Q sub H over W, right? And then I have to find the coefficient of performance with the temperature. So you don't need to get the Q sub L, but you end up having to do a similar type of calculation. So I, did, I do have this number. So if you do this, then you get uh, 683 watts as the answer for part A, all right? Any questions? Nope. All right. So what about then uh, part B says now we're going into summer mode. So part B, summer. So our cartoon is, so now we're gonna, I'm going to run that. Um, that heat pump the other way. So I'm going to run it as a refrigerator. Uh, but um, here's the house. Now the opposite is happening. So now uh, the house is, uh, I should put it from here, ignore that, uh, receiving heat from the surroundings. The surroundings are now at, uh, what was the, the summer temperature was, oh, that's what I want to find. So, um, so this, of course, is going to have to take this heat from the house, the heat that gets added from the surroundings. And, of course, it's going to dump it into the surroundings. So this is... what I don't know. And then, of course, I still need to drive this pump. So now this is, instead of a loss, is of course a gain. But I, they tell me that it's the same uh, rate. So it's 0.5 per degree temperature difference. So this is 0 0.5. And I need a delta T. What makes this part of the problem a little bit more difficult is that I don't know that delta T right away because I don't know the surrounding temperatures. But I do know the house temperature. In the summer, the house is at 25. So I know that um, this is TH minus 25. 
And uh, what else do I know? I know that I'm going to run the same, the, twice the power that I got in part A. So I know that W this time is twice the 683. So whatever that number is, let's just write 2 times uh, 683 watts. So this time I know the power. All right. Okay, so I need to find this TH. So how do I proceed? Well, let's do it uh, like, like he said, so do it a little bit different. The other way you could do the first part of the problem. Let's do it in terms of the coefficient of performance. So if I write the coefficient of performance of this refrigerator, by definition is the Q that it is extracting, right? this is my QL, and this is my QH. So by definition is QL over the work input. And of course, this is um, QL, and then the work input is the difference between the heat transfer rates. So this is QH minus Q dot L. Or if I do it in terms of the temperatures, because it's an ideal refrigerator, I can replace all of, I can, it's not really a replacement, but I can, the whole ratio can be written in terms of the ratio of temperature. So this would be uh, TL over TH minus TL. All right. And of course, the, the QL, just like in part A, the QL is the gain, right? So this QL is um, 0 0.5 TH minus 25, right? And uh, W dot was given is 2 times 683, right? And then on the right-hand side, so this is the Q over W. On the right-hand side, uh, the TL is the house temperature, but I need to put it in Kelvin, so that's 298. And at the bottom, I have the TH minus uh, 25. I'm sorry, let's uh, TH minus 25, that's, uh, let's see, what am I doing here? Um, yeah, that's correct, right, because TL is, um, is 25. So the only thing I don't know in this equation is TH. And I can solve for TH. Yes? Well, it's a difference, right? So it doesn't matter, right? Because it's a difference, right? So, um, <clears throat> If you, you have to be careful because it's a difference. If you leave it like that, then you get the temperature in Celsius, right? But if you put it in, if you put this 25 and this 25 in Kelvin, then you get the temperature in, in Kelvin. But because it's a difference in this particular case, it doesn't matter. Play it safe, though. I think your question is good in that regard. Play it safe and write the, these temperatures in, um, in Kelvin. So this is 298. And this is 298. But try both ways. See what happens. Mm. Right. So that's the only thing uh, that when you solve for that, it's a quadratic. You know, you see it right away, but you get it as a quadratic, but you have a calculator. So, um, <clears throat> so if you do this, you get, um, you get TH of uh, 53.6 Celsius. So that's the maximum outside temperature that, that, that's, that this refrigerator can work with to maintain the house at 25. Right? If it goes higher than that, then the house will get warmer. All right? So this problem, um, 
is not straightforward. This is, this is a tricky problem. Any questions about the problem? Okay. Let's see, let's do another one from another part. Um, okay, how about this one? Okay, so now we have a turbine. So say that we have a turbine operating in steady state it's also adiabatic okay and has an isentropic efficiency say a turbine of 80% So this turbine receives a certain flow rate, which of course is steady state, so it's the same, and delivers power. Okay, so what it says is uh, that what goes into the turbine is a certain monoatomic gas. So the fluid is a monoatomic gas for which we are given C sub P and C sub V. So C sub P is five kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and C sub V is three. So we're given C sub P and C sub V for this monatomic gas. It says that the inlet pressure is 500 kilopascals, at the inlet, and at the exit we have 100 kilopascals and uh, 300 Kelvin. And then we're asked to find A, the inlet temperature, All right. let's call this uh, 1 and 2. So inlet, so inlet temperature is T1. Uh, then find the work per unit mass. So produced by the turbine. So this would be the power divided by M dot. Work per unit mass coming out of the turbine. And to determine how much entropy is generated per unit mass? So S generation, right? which would be the, again, the generation per unit time over the flow rate. That's what we are to find. OK, so if I want to study for this problem, what chapter do I study? Uh, okay, yeah, it's like actually you need to know about two chapters. <laughs> so seven is one of them. But also chapter, um, no, cha well, cha well, Sure. I mean, you really need to know about chapter four. You really need to know a little bit about chapter six and about chapter seven. So this problem uh, requires concepts that appears in those three that appear in those three chapters. Okay. So how do I do this? Even though the problem doesn't ask us to do something, it's sometimes useful to do it. Uh, so the problem is not asking to do a diagram, but um, it's useful for these type of problems involving isentropic efficiencies of these devices to do a diagram. 
And in this case, I think the best choice is to do a Molière diagram, HS. So, so if we have an inlet here, which is at, um, so this is one. And so let me put here my, what does this blue line represent? That's a what? An isobar, yes. And so this is the inlet pressure. So this is 500 kilopascals. And then of course I have another isobar down here which is 100 kilopascals. And then I have, I should draw two processes here as I am studying this. I would draw one that goes straight down and I would draw another one that goes to the right. And what's the difference between those two? Which one is ideal? Straight down is ideal. So if this is one, then this is two, and this is two s. All right. Okay. So um, what can I do then? But let's go in order. So like we need to find that temperature T one. Um, so if I write um, the equation, for example, for the efficiency that was given to me for part A, the efficiency of this turbine is defined in terms of what? Real work over ideal work, right? And um, in terms of the first law of thermodynamics, what's the real work? And I wrote them in per unit mass. Obviously, it doesn't matter whether you write it as total power or per unit mass because the m dot cancels out. But what is the W if you think of the first law of thermodynamics? H1 minus H2. Very good. This comes from the first law. That part comes from the first law for an open system. So to know that, you need to know chapter four, right? that uh, the work out of a turbine, because it's adiabatic. There is no heat transfer. So it's just H1 minus H2. And the ideal one is H1 minus H2S. All right? This is a monoatomic gas. What is that information for? Why do I care that it's a monatomic gas? CP and CV are constants. Right? CP and CV are constants. So I don't have to worry about integrating anything that has a CP and a DT. I just take the CP as a constant. So if I write this, H, this delta H's in terms of the delta T's, right? Uh, this is H1 minus H2 is what? Is CP. T1 minus T2, right? And this is CP T1 minus T2S. Obviously, the CP drops out. So I can write the efficiency in terms of just the temperatures. Right? T1, T2, T1, and T2S. OK, so what do I know? Why do I not know? Let me write the final result here. Efficiency was given. Right? T T one I'm looking for. I don't know T one. T two was given is three hundred. Right? What about T two S? This temperature at two S. I don't know that either. So I seem to have two unknowns here. So I cannot solve for T one because I don't know what T two S is. Is there any way that I can either get T to S or get another equation that anybody can think of before studying for the final. Huh? 
Go to the tables. Um, what table? Table for a monoatomic gas of unknown name. Right? So there, this, this gas won't be in a table. Yes? Uh, you're on the right track. It actually gets easier than that. He said, you know, use the property relations. In fact, let me show you that since we're doing a review. Um, what he's talking about is, ah, look at this. <clears throat> what he's talking about Natural logs. He's talking about this. Yeah. Ideal gas with constant CV and CP. Bingo, that's us. Yeah. So delta S equals CV natural log, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, and here, in fact, it says if isentropic, these are equal to zero. Because if, if it's isentropic, this is equal to zero. Right? And what is it about the T2S? The T2S in our problem, did you write it down? I'll, I'll bring it back if anybody needs to see it again. But we have those two equations. Um, so the T2S that we were asking about a moment ago is the result of the expansion through the turbine if the turbine is ideal. Right? And if the turbine is ideal, then it is Isentropic because we already know it's adiabatic. And the condition for it to be isentropic is that it be both adiabatic and ideal. So that's my T2S. So that means that what he's saying is true. I can take these equations, and uh, my T2 would not be the T2, it would be a T2S, right? Because it's for that process that is isentropic. Now, it gets better. I told you it gets easier than this because we're assuming constant CVs and CPs. Uh, this can be written by combining, using properties of the natural logs in things that look like this one at the bottom in the red box. I did that already in a lecture, so in fact this is already in a previous lecture. But you can combine those, for example, to get this one in the red box, I'm using the first one and just combining using the properties of the natural logs. So I get that. Now, what would be a nice one to have? This one has temperatures and volumes. That's not as nice. But if I go to the next ones, then there is one that has temperatures and pressures, and there is one that has pressures and volumes. So I have three choices. All three equations come from the same two equations that we just saw. But so of these three choices, in these um, three red boxes, which one do I pick? For this problem, the second one, because I have the pressures. Right? The last one, remember, is the one that has the volumes and the pressures is then that we say, oh, this looks like a polytropic process. And that's where we, def we decided that, um, or arrived at the conclusion that an isentropic process is a polytropic process with the exponent being equal to k, to the ratio specific. It's, but here we want this one. So this would be on your equations, hopefully. right? And then you say, okay, I'm going to um, grab that one from there. And if I do that for this problem, let me go back here to where I was. Uh, where is my problem? Oh, here it is. So if I go back here, then I take, let me write that equation then, taken from there, is uh, T, it says like this. That's where you have to be also careful. It says T2 over T1 equals P2 over P1 to the R over CP. That's what was in that red box. So the red box doesn't tell me that it's T2S. I have to know that to use this equation in this problem, this is not T2, but T2S. 
because the one that exits at 2 is not isentropic. I need the one for the isentropic. So I make that an S. Right? That's an isentropic process. And now let's look at what we have and what we don't have in this equation. Again, we don't have T2S, we don't have T1, but we have the pressures. And CP was given, what about R? CP minus CV. So we were not given R, but we know it's the difference. So R is 2. Right? So that means that we have all of that. And again, another pro problem that has a little bit of a, of a trick to it, because what you have in the, is this, these two equations that have two unknowns. Right? So there is the, the unknowns are T1 and T2S. Right. So you, for example, could uh, take the second one and solve for T2S and then plug that in there and then solve for T1. Right. Two equations, two unknowns. All right. Questions? Nobody? Okay, uh, how are we doing here on time? Let's do another one. Let's see. Okay, here's a problem that has a few things. So in this problem, we have a refrigeration cycle, okay? And uh, it's a typical uh, refrigeration cycle with a condenser, expansion valve, evaporator. What's missing? What device is missing? Huh? Not a turbine, but a compressor. There is not a turbine in your refrigerator, but a compressor. Right? So, <clears throat> compressor needs to be driven. The condenser releases. Uh, the Q to the surroundings. The evaporator takes the heat from the low temperature compartment. And then uh, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. All right. <clears throat> All right, so this is what we know. We know the refrigerant is. Uh, R134A, right? and the flow rate, M dot, is 0 0.05 kilograms per second. That's how much refrigerant is running the loop. Okay. Um, they tell us to think of the compressor as being adiabatic. So this is this compressor is insulated. And they tell us that the process through the condenser and the process through the evaporator are isobaric, which is typical. So this is isobaric and this is isobaric. Okay, then you get a table that looks like this. And I need one more line. All right. And uh, so here is um, state one through four, the four points denoted there. Here is the pressure in kilopascals. Here is the temperature in Celsius. 
here is the quality here is H in the proper units and here is S and the table has already some numbers in it so there is a minus 20 here there is a 40 here there is a 1 here there is a 0 here that's it so you need to complete this table I wonder if this is right um, no, I think yeah, I think this is right. So you need to complete this table. This has to be another piece of information. No, there isn't. Okay. So how do we go about completing this table? Well, let me ask you. Let me tell you what the questions are. You need to find a the power to drive the compressor, the heat transfer in the evaporator. So that's uh, Q sub L. The heat transfer in the condenser, Q sub H. And the COP of this uh, refrigeration cycle. And it, it's asking you to plot it on a TS diagram. So let's, we're going to do that. We're going to start doing that first. So TS diagram. So I'll start doing that here. T, S, put a dome, and let's see if you can do something with the data that we have. All right. So the ones we have most information, uh, and therefore those are the most useful, are of course two and four. Because for two, we have the temperature and the quality, and for four, we have the temperature and the quality. So those are easy. Let's start with two. Uh, minus 20, so maybe we're going to put a minus 20 here, since that seems to be an important temperature in this cycle. And there is a 40, so let's put the 40 there. So where is uh, state two? Minus 20, 1, takes me right across to here. All right. And where is 4? 40, but zero quality. So it's right here. All right. Uh, let's see, do we know? Ah. I knew it needed another piece of information. Adiabatic and reversible. Magic words. Right? The compressor is adiabatic and reversible. OK, so can somebody tell me where um, 2 is? Oh, did I make a mistake? This is 2, right? We already know where 2 is. Two is what I call one. So, so can somebody tell me where three is? Directly above two, how far above? The condenser is isobaric, the evaporator is isobaric. So I should draw something else on this diagram. Draw the isobars. So obviously there is an isobar that goes right through there and then keeps going on that way. Right? And there is another isobar down here that keeps going on that way. Okay? So where is two? I mean, where is three? Right above two on that isobar. Right? So go straight up, that's three. Because this process is isentropic. And it has to go from the low pressure to the high pressure. All right, good. Where is one? And that was where a lot of people slipped. 
Where is one? Anybody knows? So in other words, the question is, what happens through that expansion valve? Does anybody remember what happens through an expansion valve? Pressure drops. In fact, we know where to go in terms of the pressure, right? Pressure is going to drop from, uh, from the pressure of the, blue, the top blue isobar to the pressure on the lower blue isobar. Yes? Does it turn saturated liquid into the saturated vapor? So where is that? Where is, that? Is, is that going to put one right at two? But then it's not a saturated vapor. But so it saturates the liquid and stays saturated the liquid. <clears throat> Let's debate that. Any other ideas as to what happens through an expansion valve? That's key to the answer. What happens through an expansion valve? Go down and then to the right. That is correct. Why are you saying that? That is very good. So um, it has to go to that pressure. So we know we're going to that blue line. If it goes straight down, it would be isentropic, right? And he knows it's not isentropic, that a valve is actually highly uh, non-isentropic. It generates entropy. Um, <clears throat> even if I insulate it, which I am assuming that it will insulated, there is no heat losses there. There will be entropy generation. So that is correct. There is another way to find, to state that this has to be the case if somebody remembers something from chapter 4 about valves. Try to see if you can do in your head, and if you can, I'll do it. Let's just spend a few seconds in your head. What would be the first law of thermodynamics for this valve? You can do it in your head because you can knock out many terms. You think of the first law and see what you're left with. First law. First of all, we're assuming it's steady state. Right? This valve is operating in steady state. The next terms are Q minus W. What is Q for the valve? I just said it a moment ago. It's adiabatic, so zero. Right? What about W? What's left? M dot H1. Well, in, in our case, is 4. In is 4. Out is 1 in, in our problem. So what happens to that valve? Enthalpy is the same as you cross the valve. Right? So when you cross the valve, the enthalpy doesn't change. So what that means is that we know already two properties at the exit of that bulb, we know that um, we know the pressure, which is whatever pressure is down here, and we know the enthalpy, because the enthalpy is the same. If you happen to look it up, and you will have to do it to finish the problem, um, you find out that it has to be to the right, because enthal enthalpy stays the same, but the entropy, as he said, increases. So that puts then one here. Just remember that a valve is isentalpic. Right? And so I'm going down that way. And that finishes the uh, cycle. OK, so let's, um, let's do the pressure. For that, of course, we need to look at a table. So what is the pressure that is, I'm going to enter, say, at 2? I just need to go to the table and look the saturation pressure for this refrigerant at that um, and obviously, there should be a table here. I don't see one here. 
there's one here. So if you just go to the saturated table for refrigerant 134 and enter it at uh, 40, you find uh, a pressure of 1,017. Where's my finger? There. 1,017. And then for minus 20, it's uh, 170, I'm sorry, uh, 134 if we round it. Right. So those numbers then we can enter here. Let me put them in red. Um, so what did I say? 1017 and 134. Thank you. All right. For 2 and 4. Now, of course, what is the pressure at 1 is the same as 2. So this should also be a 134. And uh, the pressure at 3 is also the pressure at 4, so that's 1017. So that fills that up. All right? That's a little too big. All right. Now, as for the temperatures, then, of course, uh, we need to do, well, uh, for 1, right, the temperature at 1, is also the minus 20, so I can put that in there. So the last temperature at 3, I will need to uh, look that up, right? So because I, um, I know the pressure, and I'll have to get an entropy from the table. So in fact, let's, let's do those now. 2 is uh, uh, saturated vapor, so I can just go ahead and look those two entries for H and S at 2 from the same table that I was just looking at. This is 386 and this, I'm going to round this to, and this is 1.74. I'm going to round so I can fit it in my table here. 174. <laughs> That's straight from the saturated table. And then at 4, I do the same thing. I go to the saturated table, but this time I read the liquid values, the HF and the SF. And again, so this will be 257, and this will be 1.19, straight from the table. And then, of course, I know that 2 to 3 is isentropic. So when I go to 3, I just copy the same entropy as 2, 174. And I know that, I just told you, 4 to 1 is isenthalpic. So I just copy uh, the enthalpy of 4, and I put it the same as 1. So 257, same as the one at 4. All right. Then what about the quality at 3? What's the quality at 3? You know that from the first exam. All right. <clears throat> Not applicable. And the quality at 1, I'll have to find, right? Uh, how do I find the quality at 1? From the quality relation or equation, right? So I come here and I say, um, I know H1, right? It's equal to H4. So um, uh, H4, 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 257. So the 257 is equal to the HF that I'll read in the table, X1 HFG. Those come from the table, right? So from here I get the quality at 1. And if you want that number, that is 0 0.39. Just taking this from the table and this from the table. What table, of course, at minus 20, right? So at minus 20 Celsius, I'm doing that. Once I have x1, then I can find um, s1, right? Because s1 will be sf plus 0 0.39 sfg. Same table. 
and that will give you 1.23. So now you can enter that here for 1 is 1.23. And as you can see, it went up. So it's 1.23 at uh, 1, where it was 119 at 4. So indeed, it, it goes up. And then the quality, we can also enter it. We just found that is 0 0.39. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go through these now. The, the power, how do I get the power? Well, uh, we're going to need H3, but let's do the question for the power first. What is the power? from first law. What is the power in the turbine? First law. Steady state, adiabatic. It'll have to be H2 minus H3. Right? Realize that it's the same equation that we just used for the valve. The only difference is that for the compressor, the power is not zero. Right? So instead of zero, I will have a W dot. Right? This is now not for the valve, but for the compressor. Right? So then I get this, of course, times M dot. Right? But they are asking me for the lowercase w, which is not, no, I'm sorry, they're asking for the, for the w dot. So for this, I, the m dot was given. H2 at the inlet, we already have in the table. The only one we don't have yet is H3. Right? But we know the pressure and we know the entropy. So I would have to go to the table. And, um, where is my table? So superheated, the table that was given was this one. So I have 1,017 and 1 1.74. This is my table. So I have 800, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400. I have 1,017. I'm doing an exam. I don't want to spend 20 minutes doing a fancy interpolation. I go to 1,000. Right. It's 1,017, right? So, and uh, then the entropy is uh, 174. Then I pray that there is something close to 174, and there is. Right? There is a, um, there is a 174. So I don't want to waste any more time. I just say, that's my value. So that's my temperature that I am missing. Whoops, yeah, 50, right? all the way across to the left, right? And, um, and I enter that. In fact, the statement of the problem says, complete the table below showing any needed calculation, calculations underneath and on the back, and then underline it says, you may eyeball interpolations. And so you eyeball it big time, and then you put that, um, if you do it more precisely, you get 47. But as I said, you know, everybody will be happy if you just put a 50 from your eyeball interpolation. And then you read the H also in the same table. Once you have the H, then we can go back to our calculation here, and now we have everything. H2, H3, M dot, so we do this, and we get, um, this comes out as negative 2.10 kilowatts. Negative, correct. It's a check for us that it's negative is into the compressor. Okay, how are we doing here on time? Uh, then, of course, we need to do the, the heat transfers, right? We're asked for the Q sub C and the Q sub H, right? Again, from the first law, these are, what is Q sub C? M dot times what? Here's our, the Q sub, well, not Q sub C, I'm sorry, Q sub L. 
Q sub L into the evaporator, what is that equal to? M dot times what? From first law. Right? <clears throat> two on two on one. Right? right? Remember, it's, we're always working with this equation. If you write the, the, the term that is missing, is the Q, right? So for the valve, we put both to zero. For the compressor, we put the Q to zero. But for the condenser and the evaporator, <laughs> we put the work to zero. So we get the Q dot, M dot, H. Um, this would be H in minus H out. Yes? Good question. Uh, that will work for the uh, evaporator, because the evaporator is not only asobaric, it's isothermal. Right? So you can pull that T, and he's asking whether he can use the second law with the delta S. And yes, and you would get the same number. It won't work for the um, condenser, because the condenser is not isothermal, right? it's isobaric. Uh, but that's a good question. So here, of course, is um, finally for the condenser, this is going to be H4 uh, minus H3, using the same equation uh, right above there. Um, this, of course, this number will come out to be negative. This number will come out to be positive. Let me give you those numbers. 6.48 for the QL and uh, negative 8.58 for the uh, condenser. So now we've answered uh, all the way through C. What about D? How do we get the coefficient of performance? of this refrigerator. What is the coefficient of performance of this refrigerator? Q dot, which one? L, L over W dot, right? And the Q dot L we just found is the 648. And here is a good one for you to make sure that you, I tell you. Here, you don't put minus 210, all right? When, you when you're doing the, ca the calculation of an efficiency of an SOP, I'm sorry, a COP, you put the number, right? The in and out that you need for the signs, uh, you leave them somewhere else, Because right? you, just, you just want the magnitude of how much. This is already take the work that was done needed, the power that is needed to drive it, we don't put the negative sign because then that will give us a negative COP that doesn't make any sense. There was a hand there. Yes, um, if you want to make QH positive on like the test, would you lose points because you the other convention? What is the other convention? There's no other convention. We, there is, we only have one sign convention and that's reflected here. When was that? Uh, Last year? Okay, uh, very, okay, yeah, so that's related to the point that I was just making here. So uh, when you're doing that calculation and you say work is QH minus QL, the sign is already, take, you're just taking the number there, right? No, I mean, if you just simply say, uh, just tell me whether it's in or out that leaves out any doubts, right? So if you want to avoid a problem, you would say this is in, right, to the condenser, and then you tell me this is out in the evaporator, and then nobody has to worry about any signs, right? So you, you can use whatever sign convention you want, but you have to tell me whether the heat transfer is going in or going out. Any other questions? Okay, then this is it. This is the last time we meet here. Uh, as I said, I'll be there on Thursday if you have any questions. Thank you.
and good luck on the exam. Thank you.